Uh, next slide, please. Uh, last month, we released the key figures uh, for the sector in 2020. Although it was a special year, Corona, of course, we were still able to publish very strong figures. In the context of today's webinar, I would especially like to highlight our export figure, which has increased over the past decade by nearly a quarter. Our sector exported in 2020 for 131 billion euros. And uh, in this graph, Next slide, please. It shows that our sector is undisputed the number one in the Belgian export volumes with a share of more than one third in Belgian's exports. One of the key messages of Essentia is the need for an attractive investment climate and international free trade without export restriction. It's no secret that free trade agreements offer a significant opportunity for duty savings. They make it easier for companies to reduce the landed cost of sourced products and improve profit margins on exported products. The recent study of the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency about the use of free trade agreements received our full attention, given that the chemical industry as such is explicitly mentioned in the study as making too little use of existing free trade agreements. Wouter de Koster, head of the IHR department and continuous improvement and international trade analyst at the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency, will present the key findings of the study. The main question is, of course, why are companies missing the opportunity of free trade agreements? Based on the survey you filled out, it seems that not all companies are aware of the advantages of free trade agreements, and most of them are struggling with the rules of origin. Therefore, we are happy to welcome Camille Smeijers, trade policy expert, and Wart Menard, rules of origin expert at the Federal Public Service Economy. Camille will demonstrate the free access to markets portal and what the self-assessment tool on rules of origin Rosa. Last but not least, Jimmy Gininazzi, Improvement Manager, Customs and Trade Compliance Europe and representative at the European Commission and CEFIC for DAO will give an insight how DAO get the most out of free trade agreements. I wish you a pleasant seminar and as mentioned before, do not hesitate to ask questions. Wouter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barbara. I will start sharing my screen now. If all goes well, there we are. So thank you for the introduction and the invitation to present the study, uh, Belgian Exporters and Free Trade Agreements, a good match, which we wrote uh, or which we published earlier this year uh, and which was written in cooperation with, with our partners, FIT, Avex, and Brussels and, and Foreign Affairs. So the goal was to find out to what extent Belgian exporters are using free trade agreements. And we subsequently hope to answer the question why they use or don't use free trade agreements. Um, in this session, I will try to present the overall findings while adding a specific emphasis on the findings in the chemical sector and while staying within the boundaries of the time frame I was given. So uh, let's see how this, how this juggling will work out. So in the first part of the study, we want to make to, to find out to what extent companies use free trade agreements. So we digged into uh, experimental data sets that was provided by the European Commission. And in this data set, we could find information about one year, 2019, and about 30 importing countries. So in this year, 2019, Belgian exporters had products going to those 30 countries for a value of 22 billion euro. That's layer one that you see. But that therefore does not mean that free trade in agreements had an impact on this 22 billion euro. So allow me to first go through different steps or, or peel off different layers, if you may, in order to familiarize you a little bit more with, with how to interpret those, those FTAs. So out of the 22 billion euro, only 8.4 billion euro was eligible for preferential trade. This gap is for a very small part because not all trades is, is uh, eligible under, under the free trade agreement, but mostly because a large proportion of the free trade agreements or of the products was already free of import duties before the free trade agreements was, was applied. However, it still means that on 8.4 billion euro of worth of products, no more import duties need to be paid thanks to the free trade agreement with those 30 countries. And we found that products worth 6.3 billion euro are indeed exported under the preference, preferential regime. So this means that the average preference utilization rate is 
and this is 6.3 divided by 8.4. So 74%, it's not bad. It's more or less um, the, the European average. We also found that the yearly potential duty savings, and you could also read this as a potential heightened competitiveness of Belgian exporters, uh, is well over half a billion euro, as you can see, 569 million euros. And that this used to the, to the, for the most part. So in three out of four cases, those potential duty savings are becoming actual duty savings, so they are used. But it also means that for small parts, for a value worth 132 million euros, those potential duties are not used, so they are foregone, which means that clients of Belgian exporters are still paying the import duties, even though it's not necessary, which means that the Belgian exporters are less competitive than they could be. So this is the overall picture, but in preparation of this webinar, I, I did exactly the same exercise by peeling off the layers, but just for the chemical sector. And it turns out that the, that the performance of this sector is, is pretty much in line with the, with the overall performance. So in 2019, the total value of exports, so that's layer one of chemical products to those 30 countries, had a value of 6.6 .6 billion euro. And 2.3 billion euro, that's layer two, was eligible for preferential import. So it's a very similar ratio, 2.3 out of 6.6 .6 versus 8 billion out of uh, 22 billion. The preference uh, were utilized on products with a value of 1.5 billion euro, which means that the preference utilization rate stood at 74%. And you may recall this is identical to the overall performance of Belgian exporters. So it resulted in, that thanks to the free trade agreement, the chemical sector could have potential duty savings for a sum of 114 million euro, so 114, but it also had foregone duty savings for a value of 34 million euro. So based on this very quick analysis, we could say that the chemical sector is not really underperforming, but it also isn't outperforming the Belgian exporters um, overall. At the same time, if you want to give tailored support, overall results are not what you need. The, the objective is to find out where exactly we have much potential competitive advantage and to find out mostly where this potential comp advantage is not used. So we try to find this out by combining a free trade agreement with a sector. So on the left table, um, you see 31 combinations where we have high potential duty savings. So for example, you notice for Turkey, the, the customer union with Turkey, the Belgian exporters of plastics and rubber have potential duty savings of 38.9 million euro. So all of those 31 combinations have potential duty savings of at least 5 million euro. On the right hand um, table, we did the same exercise, but this time for foregone duty savings. So how much potential is left unused? And here we have 26 combinations. So 26 times there's a free trade agreement with a Belgian uh, exporter sector where at least 1 million euro in foregone duty savings appears. So let's dive deeper into the potential duty savings uh, first. Here you see once more the list of 31 combinations, and you notice that with six appearances, um, the chemical industry is very well represented in this list. Um, only the foodstuff sector appears more often, uh, eight times in total, to be uh, more specific. But it also means that, that your sector, the chemical sector, is on the first row to, to reap the benefits of the free trade agreements. In the study, you will find that in 2019, for the six highlighted free trade agreements, so the, the six with an with a arrow, clients of the Belgian sector could save up to 87 million euro in import duties, which is more than any other sector. At the same time, I don't need to remind you that the chemical industry is by far, as I also mentioned, the, the, by far the most important export sector of our country. And given the, the value of export is very high, it's only natural that the chemical sector is also destined to stand out in, in potential duty savings. Um, something that's not in the study, but what I calculated prior to this presentation, is that no less of 76% of all the potential duty savings of the chemical sector 
are to be found in those six uh, free trade agreements that are highlighted on this slide. So as we, you remember that we um, we looked into 30 free trade agreements. Well, the, the 24 free trade agreements that are not listed on this slide only represent 24% of the potential duty savings, um, which means that the six here uh, represent 76% of the potential duty savings. Okay, if you move on to the to the foregone duty savings, um, and here you see the list again with the 26 combinations, you notice that the chemical sector appears four times and only once in the top 10. So you could say it is, it is quite a, a good performance since it appears more often when we look at potential duty savings. Uh, there it appeared three times in the top six even. So this might imply that the chemical sector is in fact outperforming its, its peers, its other Belgian export sectors. But then you can ask yourself the question, why did it not show in the overall picture that I drew earlier in the beginning, uh, where I said that overall the chemical sector is not doing better than other sectors. Not worse, but not better neither. So we can find an answer if you look more in detail. Um, you, you notice here the first arrow with Japan, products of the chemical or light industries, 18.7 million euro in foregone duty savings. When we discussed the, the potential duty savings, I did not mention anything about countries since time is limited. But this time we really need to draw some attention to the low, low level of utilization in Japan. So it, it's a really whopping amount of foregone duty savings that, that the chemical sector has in Japan. And it's, it's three times more than, than number two on this list. Base metals, uh, exports of base metal is in Egypt and, and about six times more then, then the next time the chemical sector appears the, in, in Turkey. So I'm very curious to find out where the situation turned around in 2020, because as you know, it was a brand new free trade agreement. And it's not only with the chemical sector that the free trade agreement was, was not used to its fullest extent, um, but your, your sector stood out anyway. And I was already in touch with the Belgian customs about this matter. And they indicated that the, that the Japanese custom officials often tend to ask for extra, sometimes confidential information. But, uh, well, I would like to be, uh, well, if you have more uh, things that you want to share about this after presentation or during, uh, I'm, I'm always available. Still, uh, Japan is not the only free trade agreement where considerable losses of foregone duties are observed. We also see this was the case for Mexico, Turkey, and, and South Korea. So the question here is, why do we observe this? Does it mean that Belgian exporters of chemical products simply refuse to use those FTAs in those four occasions? Are those free trade agreements too complex or too demanding, too demanding to comply with? Or is there something else at play? And in order to answer this question, we um, made a comparison with the EU average. So we did so by focusing on the duty savings rate, which is a DSR, as you, as you can see here. So the duty savings rate is calculated by um, dividing the actual duty savings by the potential duty savings. Um, overall, for Belgium, the DSR, the duty savings rate, stands at 77%. So you could see this as 77% of all the potential duty savings are used. This is also the same average for the EU. So 77% is something that you could strive for, that, that's moderate. When we look to the four free trade agreements uh, where, where the chemical sectors, uh, where the chemical sector is involved, we see some, some really interesting results. First of all, if you look at Japan, you notice that for EU competitors, using a free trade agreement is not easy neither, in 2019 at least. Um, a duty saving rate of, of 31%, which you see here, uh, is, is downright bad. But it's remarkable to see that the chemical performance is twice as bad uh, with a duty saving rate of, of only 15%, which is um, the, the worst duty saving rate uh, that was observed. Also in Mexico, you see that our Belgian, Belgian chemical companies underperform compared to the EU average. So with a duty saving rates of 74%, it's not too bad. 
it's only a little bit under the average uh, of the Belgian situation. But given the performance of the EU, it could be interesting to find out why the situation is not better. For the two remaining situations, so the, the custom union with, with Turkey and the, and the agreement with, with South Korea, we noticed that, in fact, the situation is entirely different, that the chemical exporters perform excellent, and the fact that they still face for duty savings for a value of, of a over two of, of about two million euros or over two million euro in both cases is mostly to be attributed to the fact that the free trade agreements give immense potential duty savings. So well we've seen some some big difference in the utilization of, of free trade agreements and the question then is well why is this the case and why are not all companies using free trade agreements in, in the first instance so we want to find this out by, by sending out a survey. It's something that Fit Alex of Brussels and Belgian Foreign Trade Agency did. In the end, we had 372 participating companies, of whom, as you can see on the slides, 80 mentioned that they use free trade agreements, 185 said that they don't, and 107 companies said that they relied on a third party. Um, previous to this to this webinar, um, also, you were asked, if I was not mistaken, to, to answer or to fill out some questions about the, the utilization of free trade agreements. Um, for about 13 or 14 among you answered the questions and, and the big majority, all, almost all but one actually, said you use free trade agreements. So that's that, that's at least a, a very good start. It's absolutely not the case in our, in our survey. Um, and what we found there is that those who use free trade agreements tend to be larger companies. So there's there's a clear link there. Um, a majority of the companies that use free trade agreements do so because it improves their competitiveness rather than because the importer asks them to do so. And this is also something that I noticed based on your answers that you gave to, uh, to the Essentia survey. A significant part, almost two thirds of the companies using free trade agreements, perceive that being able to use a free trade agreement is of decisive importance for the export strategy. And what is maybe even more remarkable is that 19% of the companies say that the free trade agreement is this important, that without it, they would even stop exporting to the country involved. Nevertheless, only about half of the companies using free trade agreements mention that they actively play out this advantage uh, of lower import duties in their selling proposition. And probably one of the most interesting findings uh, in, in, in this survey, and, and no doubt one of the most counterintuitive findings, was that most exporters of that use free trade agreements indicates that it's easy for them to prove the rules of origin. And it's not something that we expected. It's not something that that Baiba expected, I suppose, or no one su suspects this. But it's the case for 73% of the, of the companies that answered the question. And in a follow-up question, um, well, we we asked, why do you think it's easy? Majority said, well, we have a dedicated team for proving the rules of origin, and then it's feasible. Um, while another big part, and there were mostly SMEs, said, well, in fact, we have most of our uh, components coming from Belgium or from within the European Union, or we have short value chains. So it's not that difficult to, to prove the rules of origin. Um, a last, well, what I maybe want to add there is, even though in the survey of Essentia that, that you made, um, 13 out of 14 uh, companies said that they use free trade agreements, we did see that Eight out of those 13 company, uh, companies still mentioned they had some kind of problems or that they um, saw some difficulties while using free trade agreements. So it, it clearly is the case that it's not because you use free trade agreements that you don't face any difficulties. And that's that's a really important thing that we should take or that we should consider as, as policymakers as well. Um, Maybe one last finding about companies using free trade agreements, and that's that custom procedures are rarely a cause of concern, although we just uh, mentioned that this was different for, for Japan. 
Now, if we take a look at companies not using free trade agreements, um, first remark, it's mostly SMEs. The, they are overrepresented. And about half of the companies that are not using free trade agreements say that they are not doing so because they lack proper information. This is by far the most quoted reason, and it's it's one of the uh, well. It, it, therefore, it's it's a great idea that Essentia is organizing this webinar. Uh, I, I think there there can be enough of this kind of of sessions. Um, one slide ago, we said that proving the rules of origin is not that difficult. At the same time, it can be it can contradict with the fact that companies not using free trade agreements lack information. So we will do a new study. Um, uh, exactly re repeating this study, but this time we will ask to companies that say we lack information, we will ask what information do you lack exactly? Um, is it that you don't know whether you comply with the regulations? Is it that you don't know how to prove the origin, how to claim the benefit? So it's something that we will look deeper into. And the second most often reason uh, for not using free trade agreements and that's maybe slightly more surprising than a lack of information, is that many companies basically make the deliberate choice of not using a free trade agreement. And then again, we see two reasons for this, or two main reasons. The first one is because their importer does not ask for it. So why would they go through all the effort uh, in the end if, if they can make the sale anyway? And a second uh, often quoted reason is that um, they fear that it, it, it might make the, the export procedure more, more troublesome. Um, apart from a lack of, of, of information and a deliberate choice not to use free share agreements, we found to a much lesser extent other reasons why exporters do not use free trade agreements, um, not being eligible for preferential trades, problems at the border, uh, finding it difficult to obtain a certificate of origin, but they are really minor. Uh, problems according to the survey that we had. And finally, the last last slide, we arrived to, um, to to this specific topic about shipping agents or custom brokers or, or, or freight forwarders or how you will call them. Um, we, we know that a vast majority of, of SMEs mostly um, simply want to produce their goods uh, and all the other things are taken care of by, by other parties, by experts. So this also seems to be the case for export procedures. No less than 30% of the companies participating to our survey indicated that they were in this situation and SMEs were overrepresented. And here it's striking that a vast majority, uh, about 81% if I'm not mistaken, of companies in this category does not know what they are actually making use of free trade agreement or not. And if, if they don't know, well, they, they don't. Um, and only 17% of companies working with shipping agents is certain that they use free trade agreements. And this is also what I've seen from the Essentia um, um, survey. There was only one company saying, I'm not using free trade agreements. And this company was referring to the third party uh, and whether they actually did not know whether this third party was making use of it or not. But the gap between the companies wanting to use free trade agreements, but not doing so, um, and and the and the shipping agents or custom brokers or freight forwarders on the other side who do not deliver this service at the moment. Well, it's, it's really interesting. So that's also a reason why we decided to look deeper into this, and we contacted uh, an umbrella organization for freight forwarders, um, and we hope to get more information about this topic soon. So I, I think I covered the most important elements and, and try to, to draw some attention to the chemical sector more specifically. As I mentioned, there is a follow up uh, study foreseen and it will be very valuable to, to find out whether the situation of 2019 is, is confirmed or, or whether it's maybe uh, contrasted. Um, certainly with, a, with the chemical sector performance in Japan would be very interesting to find out if this improved drastically or not. Um, but also the findings in the survey, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, if you are too, well, Essentia will be uh, made aware of, of these, uh, of the follow-up study for sure. And I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain they will inform you of it. 
And at the same time, uh, I remain at, at your service as well, of course. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll start sharing my presentation. So I just have one slide to show you before I start with the practical part of the presentation. Uh, just a few words on what Access to Market actually is. It was launched in October 2020 by the European Commission, and it's an interactive and free tool to use for businesses to help them trade and also make the most out of the EU free trade agreements. You find their information tailored to your products, uh, for example, the applicable tariffs, the rules of origin, there's a tool that will help you evaluate what the or origin of your product is. It's called ROSA. Also the applicable taxes, the different custom and import procedures, uh, other requirements that have to be met when you export or import. And besides that, the portal also contains information on all the trade barriers that are reported to the European Commission. And you are also able to report trade barriers yourself on the portal. Now I'll go to the website of Access to Markets. So you find a lot of general information about different goods, services, investment, different markets. You can, if you go to market, you can find information on non-EU markets, on all the different free trade agreements that the EU has. Also, if you go to services or investment, you can find what the free trade agreements entail for services and for investment. And for goods, you have general information on many things. But if you go to the home page, you see here in, the, in yellow, My Trade Assistant. And this is a practical tool where you can find information tailored to your products. So you just have to fill in the product name or the HS code, the country of origin and the country of destination. In my case, I want to export bandages to Vietnam. If you click on the search bar, you will find a couple of options because I didn't give the exact HS code. The tool will help you find it. So you will have to see what the product is exactly that you want to export. You here see the, S the HS code and then you can just select product and find the information that you want. So here you find all the information for exporting bandages from Belgium to Vietnam. Here you see on the left the different segments. The first one is the different tariffs. You see three options here. You have the general duty rate of 12%, and this is applicable to uh, all goods that are not coming from countries that are part of the WTO, or goods where the origin is unknown or doubtful. Then the second one is the most favorite nation uh, tariff of 8%, which is applicable to uh, goods that are traded between WTO members. For example, if you export your product to China or to the US, you will uh, be able to use the MFN tariff. The third one is the EU preferential rate of 5.2 percentage. This one is mentioned here because the EU has a free trade agreement uh, with Vietnam. So companies can enjoy this lower preferential rate, but only if they can prove that their product is originating from the EU or from Vietnam. So uh, a proof of origin have, has to be presented if you want to enjoy the lower rate. Below the tariffs, you also see a graph that shows more information about the tariffs dismantling. So over time, the EU preferential rate under the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement will uh, become smaller. So in 2027, you won't have to pay any tariffs when you export bandages from Belgium to Vietnam if you can prove the origin uh, that is the EU or Vietnam. So it's useful information for companies for their long-term strategy. They can see they have an idea of how the tariff will look like over the years to come. Then under tariffs, you have a subheading as well. And here you can compare the, ta the tariffs that are applicable uh, between products that are similar to each other, just all under the same HS heading 3005. So you can see here that bandages, gauze, other products, they all have similar tariff rates. But in certain other categories, for example, white chocolate, compared to other candies, you can see that the tariffs are different. So 
one product might be easier or, or cheaper to export than another product. The second segment is the rules of origin. Here you can evaluate the origin of your product. So you can, uh, by filling in a lot of questions, you can see if your product is originating from the EU and Vietnam and whether you then can enjoy the preferential EU tariff rate. But my colleague Wart will explain it more in detail, the ROSA tool. The third segment is all about taxes. So here you can see what national taxes are applicable to your product in Vietnam. And in this example, it's a VAT rate of 5% of the duty paid value. But this depends on the exporting on your destination country. Another large segment is the procedures and formalities. You first have a general overview of country information of Vietnam. On the right side, you can see what is all available. It's about SPS rules, registration requirements, uh, imports that are prohibited, uh, information on marking, labeling, and so forth. It's a general overview. Second, you have the general um, requirements that are applicable to all goods exported to Vietnam. So you can take some out of the list. For example, the customs import declaration form that you need to fill in, information on the commercial invoice, uh, the proof of preferential origin. It also contains templates that you can use when you export to Vietnam. And the third category is the specific product requirements. So these are requirements specific to your uh, example from your search, so here to bandages. For example, if you want to export bandages from Belgium to Vietnam, you will have to submit a document that certifies that certain tests, physical, chemical, microbiological tests, have been carried out by an appropriate laboratory in the country of export. So you need this form in order for customs clearance and market access, but it's a small list of specific product requirements. So that's also quite useful to know what documents you need before you start exporting. The next segment is the one on trade barriers. So here you will find all trade barriers that are reported to the Euro Commission for export to Vietnam. It's quite a long list for this example, but you have both the active trade barriers, but also the ones that are already resolved. Now with these three barrier barriers, they can either be horizontal barriers, so they're applicable to all goods that are exported. They can be specific to HS codes. So if there's a trade barrier linked to this HS code, you will also find it here, but there are also barriers reported here that are not linked to an HS code, but rather to a specific sector. So for example, if you click here, you will find more information about this specific barrier. You can see here it's a horizontal one. And you can find a bit more information about the, uh, the barrier. So here it's about public procurement that Vietnam still discriminates against EU companies that want to apply for a pro public procurement uh, project. They still um, give preferential treatment to domestic producers rather than uh, follow the rules under the FDA. Um, then if you go back, one of the last segments is the one on trade flow statistics. So here you can see uh, information about the trade flows of bandages between Belgium and Vietnam and also the EU and Vietnam for a few years and also in value and in quantity. So it's also nice to know for the company to have an idea of the export flows. Uh, the last segment that is available is a little help to understand all the different options that are mentioned here, information on the tariff rates, about rules of origin. So it's just a bit more help to, um, to know how you can read all the results. The second example that I wanted to show you is an import example. So I've chosen this specific HS code, it's uh, Aceton, and I want to import it from China. So if you click on the search bar, you can find here uh, to which uh, HS code this product belongs, which category. And then here you can find the detailed information for this product. Um, so here you can see two tariff options. The first one of 5.5% is the, um, the non-preferential common customs, customs tariff that is applied by all EU member states. So 
because we don't have an FDA agreement with China, this is actually the MFN tariff. So the one that is applicable uh, with WTO members. But there is a small exception. The tariff would be suspended, so it would be 0% if your um, product is destined for certain categories of ships, boats and other vessels and for drilling and production platforms. So that it's an exception to the rule. And here, if you click, for example, here, you can find more information about what um, conditions have to be met for you to enjoy the 0% tariff. The second segment is on taxes. Again, uh, if you import this, you will have to pay a VAT of 21%. Uh, because the taxes are not harmonized in the EU. If you import it, uh, for example, from China to France, it might be different, or to Germany. The third category is, again, an overview with all the import requirements, import procedures. In the overview, you will find information about food and food safety, environmental protection, product safety, standardization, packaging, general information about EU rules. In the general part, you can find again information about documents that you need when importing commercial invoice, package, packing list, freight documents, and also the templates. So you have an idea what kind of information you have to fill out. And then again, you have the specific product requirements. So if you want to import uh, acetone from China, the EU requires you to um, listen to the EU marketing requirements for chemicals. So that it has to be um, um, okay with the EU rules. Uh, the trade flow statistics, it's again showing information when you about the import streams from China to Belgium and from China to the EU over the years with the value and the quantity to have an idea how much is being imported of this product from China and again, how to read the results with more information in detail about the different segments. So it's quite a useful tool. Some of you may have already used it to know more information about specific products uh, going from country A to country B. It's uh, quite interesting to know um, and helpful to have more information, not only on the tariffs that are applicable, but also on the rules of origin and on the import procedures. But besides my trade assessment, access to markets has a lot of other information as well. If you go to uh, goods, goods main concept and then trade barriers, you will find more information about what type of trade barriers there are and also where you can report them. Um, so if you click here on the contact us, you will come to a little contact uh, form and you want to make a complaint about market access. And here, you, if you have a, if you're facing a trade barrier with your export, you can make the complaint here. You have to describe the barrier. You have to describe the impact it has on your sector. Give a lot of information, but it's a very important source of information for the European Commission. It's a priority for them to enforce the EU trade rules. So companies are really encouraged to make use of this complaint form when they are facing trade barriers. It will help the Commission to address the complaint and also to resolve it with the third country. So that was the end of my presentation. There's a lot of more information you can find on access to markets. I recommend going through the different options depending on the needs of your companies and the information you are required. But also if you have any additional questions, you can ask them during uh, today's webinar, but you can also send them to this email address on the slides. Um, and we'll try to help you if you have any complaints about access to markets. It's continuously updated as well. So if something's wrong with the website, we contact the European Commission to improve it. The Commission itself is also constantly, constantly updating the access to markets platform. For example, uh, in the case of certain WTO cases between the US and the EU, the extra tariffs that might be raised, it's also updated on the website. So you really have the latest information available for when you're exporting your product to a third country. 
So with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and give the word to Wart, my colleague, who will tell you more about uh, ROSA, the tool to evaluate the uh, rules of origin. Thank you, Kami, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Also on my behalf, I'm busy sharing my screen with you, so if everything goes according to plan, you should be able to see my presentation for the moment. So just my, uh, like my colleague Camilla, uh, I just prepared one slide for you today, which is uh, the two examples I used. But uh, certainly don't worry because afterwards, after the session uh, from um, after this webinar, you will certainly be sent the presentations so you can uh, read everything I've said in my presentation in the coming minutes um, at, at home. So I prepared two examples for you today. One is uh, soap and I will export this soap uh, to the UK and to Canada. And the second one is uh, menthol. So I suggest we jump right into the action. Uh, now, like my colleague Camille just said, uh, access to markets is a very helpful and easy to use free tool. And uh, one of the most important tools, well, according to me at least, is uh, the Rules of Origins uh, self-assessment tool, so ROSA, which will help you to comply with uh, what people often find difficult, being the Rules of Origin of a free, a free trade agreement, which is the key of getting preferential access to a certain uh, country. Now, to start with my uh, example of SOAP, as you can see here, uh, instead of uh, what Camille did, I used the HS code of SOAP and I already selected a country of origin, uh, let this be Belgium in this case, and a country of destination. What you do is you click the search bar and then you will access this page. Now, to avoid uh, crashing my internet, I already put up my tabs so uh, that way we can go a little bit quicker. And the first page we'll see here is uh, the tariff page. So as you can see here, normally in most favorite nation uh, cases, so the, the countries uh, which do not have a preferential free trade agreement with each other, uh, you would pay 6.5% uh, of the value of these uh, soap being traded to Canada. But the reason I took this example is because, uh, well, as you can see here, under the 6.5%. In certain cases, and now as we are experiencing the uh, corona uh, pandemic, uh, certain goods can be exported to Canada without any duties due. So I think it is important to stress here that in certain cases, and I think, uh, well, on a regular basis, it is interesting for you as an exporter or as a producer to regularly check the duties due for certain countries of export, because I will come back to this example later, but if there are no duties due, then, it, uh, then you do not need Need to present uh, any proof for preferential origin because you do not save any uh, taxes when exporting to that country. Now, uh, one thing before uh, starting with the rest of the presentation, one thing I would like to make clear is that, uh, as you can see in this example here, uh, you always need to export to a country with which the UK and, and Belgium in, in general, uh, of course, has a uh, free trade agreement. Why is that? Because, well, you can, of course, not check the uh, rules of origin applicable to your product when there is no free trade agreement to check with. So to just show you uh, an example of, of this scenario, uh, here I exported the soap I previously uh, spoke of uh, from Belgium to Iran. Iran, which is a country which the EU does not have a free trade agreement, uh, in place and there you can see there is a uh, most favorite nation tariff of 26 percent but as you can see here on the left well, i forgot to put this in english my ex uh, my apologies uh, as you can see here on the left there is no uh, rosa so no rules of origin self-assessment tool available for export to iran simply because we have no free trade agreement in place so something to keep in mind you can still check like my colleague um, Kamia demonstrated to you you can still check um, uh, barriers to trade for example some results of, of trade statistics and trade with, with Iran, but of course no rules of origin self-assessment. So I was on this page explaining to you that it, uh, for the moment there is a, a specific clause enabling a tariff-free export to uh, Canada, but in normal circumstances, of course, you have to pay the uh, most favored nation rate if you are not a, a preferential trading partner of uh, Canada. And of course, as Camille already explained, you can prove this um, according to preferential uh, tariffs. Now, if you click here on the left, uh, so in the list of tariff taxes and so on, if you click here on the left of the uh, rules of origin ROSA tool, which is of course available for export to Canada as we have a free trade agreement with the country, then the first page you will see here is, uh, well, it is a long list, 
which I will take you through together. Uh, above, you can see that you, in some cases, you have to select uh, the specific product if your HS code or description was not precise enough. Uh, for this case, I took um, HS code, uh, the last one here, so 34011190. And then you will see here that the first question you are being asked, so the, the idea of the tool is to, to guide you through the um, determination of the origin of your product. And the first question you will be answering is, uh, is my product originating in the EU or Canada? So the idea behind it is really simple. Uh, you are getting asked some questions uh, which you would be in normally easily uh, be able to, to answer as a producer or as an exporter. And the first one is if you are using non-originating materials, do you fulfill the product specific rule in the um, uh, free trade agreement we have with uh, Canada? So here you can click yes or no whether you comply or not with the rule. And as you can see here, if you are not um, uh, regularly using free trade agreements, for example, which would be the case for smaller uh, companies, smaller businesses, you can always click on rule explained to see what the meaning is of the question you are being asked. So as you can see, you have several uh, questions that are being asked. Uh, mark that there is an or between them, so you only have to comply with one of the rules to fulfill uh, the first criterion for uh, preferential export. But just to show you that you can see here, uh, so the first one is product specific rules from the uh, free trade agreement. And the second one you can see here is uh, products exclusively um, produced from originating materials. So for example, if you use for your chemical product, in this case is soap, only materials from the EU or Canada, you will see that uh, uh, your product is automatically granted preferential access because, well, it is a good being produced uh, in the two partner countries uh, from roots from these partner countries. And a third possibility, but I suppose it is not very relevant for chemical products, is being wholly obtained. This could be, for example, uh, a crop which is being harvested in a certain country or minerals, fish. You, you see that there are some examples here. Uh, for some products, this could be the case that you, that you completely um, gain access or, or uh, harvest a good in one country. And in that case, of course, there is no discussion of the origin of the products. So this is the first page. Um, then the second part of the tool, so this is just under the questions you are being asked, is tips to help you comply with the product specific rules. Uh, why is this the case? Why are these tips helpful? Because in some cases you have, uh, for example, in most free trade agreements, uh, tolerances which are applicable or um, forms of accumulation, which mean you can, uh, without limit, use products of the other partner country in your products. And in that case, it is possible that you do not fulfill the product specific rule of the chemical products or another product you want to export. Uh, but then you are asked here the question whether or not you use use any of these principles. For example, like I mentioned here, the tolerance rule, uh, there is bilateral accumulation possible with Canada. So here you can um, click the button whether you comply or not with these uh, rules. And then to gain some time, uh, I already, uh, as you can see here, I already filled in um, one example here for the SOAP, stating that I comply with one of the rules. In that case, as I comply with this rule, uh, the tips to comply with the rule are not longer or no longer applicable because I already fulfilled the rule. And then you are brought to the, the third part of the questionnaire, uh, which is additional requirements for the production process. So uh, this is the case, for example, when you uh, have a product in a certain uh, or you are certain that you fulfill the rule, but there are some additional rules that you have to uh, fulfill. For example, as you can see here, the territoriality principle that the production of the good has to take place in the territory or uh, whether the EU or Canada, so one of the two partner countries. Second one, for example, is that you have to do um, a production uh, process which goes beyond minimal operations. So, for example, uh, cutting or uh, dusting something, uh, packaging, uh, that kind of things, they do not confer origin on the goods. So this is again a questionnaire you get. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, OK, you can see here. So here in this page, I fulfilled all the uh, questions or I filled in all the questions being asked uh, regarding the additional requirements for the production process. And as you can see, uh, based on the answers uh, I gave above, my product in this case will be originating in the EU or Canada. 
Now, as you can see, you get, uh, do not get a specific origin because this does not matter. The reason being simply because uh, if the good is originating in one of the two countries, you are getting granted preferential access to the other. Now, as you can see here, the second question you are being asked, which is actually uh, more to help you and to guide you through the export process, is how to document that your product is originating. Now, as you can see here, this is actually just uh, well the, the next question being asked in the in the column of the questionnaire. So here we have the originating status of your product, and uh, then you are helped to to fulfill the criteria to export this product or to more easily export this product to Canada. So a few questions here which you are being asked is whether you are a registered exporter or not. Uh, being a registered exporter is uh, required for uh, consignments above 6,000 euro. So here you could click, for example, yes, my consignment is above 6,000 euros and I am a registered exporter, which is a procedure you have to follow uh, with customs. In this case, we are exporting from Belgium to Canada. So the question if you are an exporter in Canada does not apply to us. And we also do not um, uh, send materials or uh, supply materials to another uh, EU company. So this is again part of the questionnaire you can fill in to help you comply with the rules of origin. Oh, OK, this is already in the next slide. Um, something I would like to point you to is that you still have uh, on the bottom of the questionnaire some other questions which could help you comply with the export procedure and formalities. For example, you are being asked whether you transport your product to Canada via third countries. You can here choose an answer. Well, for the results of the self-assessment, let's say I click here. Uh, yes, I comply with the transport conditions. And based on the answers I give, uh, I gave above, you can see that my product will be originating in the EU or Canada. And if you would read the text here below, uh, you would see that I comply with transport conditions as well. Now, then you get some uh, very useful tips to comply uh, to comply with um, customs procedures and export formalities. For example, you can read here how to claim a preferential import tariff. If you know that your product is preferential is of preferential origin, and you can prove this uh, by example of uh, uh, with the help of of um, uh, suppliers declaration or uh, a declaration of um, a fabrication on your own. Uh, then, of course, you have to fulfill certain uh, customs procedures to uh, fill in these documents or to provide them to submit them to customs. So here you can read how to do that. Uh, there is also a page uh, dedicated to the customs authorities and how they will uh, verify the origin of your product. And then if you're still in doubt, uh, as a last resort, I would say, you can always fi uh, file a um, questionnaire for applying for a binding origin information. And the last two pages here are to show you that um, if you would like to read in detail the um, texts and uh, parts of the agreement which are applicable to you, you can simply click here on the links to be guided directly to the uh, pages on the um, questionnaire and on the um, free trade agreement, the texts uh, which are applicable to you so you can read them uh, yourself. Now, a second short example I would like to show you is the export of soap. So the same soap as we had for the export to Canada from Belgium to the United Kingdom. Uh, the startup is the same as uh, before. So you're just given the HS code of the product, a land of origin and uh, land of destination, and you click on search. And then you come on uh, upon then you will arrive upon this page. And the reason why I show you this is because, as you can see here, for export from uh, for soap from Belgium to the UK, you will see that and the preferential EU tariff are zero. And this is a very special case because in this case, even if your product would be originating in the uh, EU or the UK, you would not save any uh, customs um, taxes because the taxes are zero. And as you can read on the uh, next page, so if you uh, would click on taxes, you would see that, for example, it is stated, I think, uh, here on the second line, that for products which uh, products for which the preferential tariff or the MFN duty is zero, that you do not have to apply for a preferential tariff because of course you will not save any um, taxes when exporting a product uh, on which there are no taxes uh, levied. 
Now, the third example I would like to give you and to conclude my presentation is a importing case. So in this case, we will import, um, I think it was Mentol I took as an example, from South Korea to Belgium, just to show you that you can use a tool as well for countries, of course, uh, with which we have an FTA in place, because otherwise you cannot uh, assess these uh, rules of origin. Uh, but the principle is uh, the same for the rest. So if you click on the search bar for, for example, import of mental from South Korea to Belgium, oh, I, my apology as I forgot to put these slides in, in English, uh, you will see here that uh, again you arrive at the uh, tariffs page. Now this is uh, a special product because you have four different uh, tariff categories, but as you can see in some cases you still have to pay duties when uh, importing from um, South Korea into the EU. But if you can prove, as I stated before, that your product is of South Korean preferential origin, in that case you would uh, be able to import duty free. So as you can see here, if you click any further on the link, you will see that you again arrive in this uh, on the same page. And this is just to show you, as I said before, that you will not get a specific origin of your uh, goods because you will be granted preferential access to the EU is if your good is uh, whether of uh, EU or South Korean preferential origin. So you can get the same page. I will just quickly, uh, quickly go through to it just to show you. And as you can see here, the same questions are being asked, tips to comply with product specific rules, originating status of your product. Of course, this is not uh, fulfilled because I did not fill in the questionnaire, how to document that your product is originating and so on and so on. So as you can see here, both for import and export to a preferential EU market, so a market which, which we have a, a free trade agreement in place, uh, you will see that you are uh, guided through the same questionnaire, which is actually very easy to use and which is a tool we uh, often use at the Federal Public Service ourselves because it is uh, much more easy to uh, just click on a few buttons and, and check the rules which are applicable to a certain product than to uh, read the agreements which are in place with certain countries uh, by yourself because mostly they are very technical and very detailed. So in this case, you are very, um, really pointed to the information which is relevant to your products. And this is the last slide I wanted to show you. This is just a result uh, of the uh, fulfilling of the questionnaire um, importing from South Korea to Belgium, the um, uh, the mental. So as you can see here before, in this case, I already filled in the questionnaire to gain some time. And even for this importing case, you will be arriving at the same page stating whether or not your product would be originating and is applicable for tariff free access. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, rest assured that my contact details are in the slides you will be sent after the uh, webinar. So if there are any queries now or uh, after the presentation, do not hesitate to contact me uh, or my colleague uh, Camille, and we will be happy to help you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Art, for your presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jimmy from uh, from Dow, and I'll give you the last part of um, the today's webinar. Just bear with me a second. I will try to pop up my slides. OK, the topic of today was, as all you know, is Belgium exporters and free trade agreements, a good match. And uh, I was allowed to give a testimonial uh, for our company, Dow. On the agenda for today, I will speak. A little, I will give a little bit of explanation about the company Dow, who we are, where we are located, what we do, and uh, the the main part of this presentation will then be how to get the most out of free trade agreements. Where I will have a look into the pros and contrasts, the challenges, why we implement or not, how we set up a trade agreement, and some Dow uh, highlights.
Um, last year, we made the 43 billion um, net sale. In 20, 2019, we have almost uh, thir more than 36,000 people employed. We manufacture in, in about 109 sites. And we have a Dow manufacturing uh, plants in 31 countries. So this is also the reason why trade agreements are quite important for us. Dow wants to be the most in innovative, customer-centric, inclusive and sustainable company in the world. And here I give you an, an overview of how uh, we are located and where we uh, manufacture the most of our products uh, on the world. Um, now let me go to the topic of the day, how to get the most out of the free trade agreement. Within DAO, the responsibility and the decision making for implementing a, treat, a, tra a free trade agreement is within the International Trade Operations Preference Team, which is part of the supply chain uh, division. Uh, I myself, I'm working for the International Trade Operations Customs and Trade Compliance Team, so I'm not directly involved in the decision making, but um, all the implementations of trade agreements is, of course, in close cooperation with other DAO stakeholders. Pros and contracts on uh, trade agreements. Uh, in our view, is what I've already said uh, multiple times during this webinar, is the, the duties, the less or zero duties uh, that needs to be paid. And for us, also important is to safeguard the business. A little bit lesser important for us is the time reduction on import, the costs on the import side, and the increase of sales. So the main um, advantages we see is the, the less duties and safeguarding our business. The contrast, uh, or and that we see is that there are no identical trade agreements or free trade agreements. And there's a lot of complexity. Um, there's a quite an administrative requirements, which then ends up with additional costs. You need to, to develop your system if you wanted to do it in a correct way. The knowledge is, is required and it's sometimes difficult to enforce your rights, but I will come back on that later on. The challenges we have, we can divide it in three topics. We have operational challenges, digitalization challenges, and the regulatory challenges. Operational wise, yeah, you have to master your, you have to maintain your master data uh, in order to be sure that in the end you do the right thing. Um, you have to request your long term vendor declarations before you can start. It's a lot of administ administrative work on. Your bill of materials need to be uh, updated and be correct. Your classification process uh, uh, needs to be done in a correct way. And also here, you, ne you need to collaborate with other specialists uh, and need to be informed when, when someone says that the classification is wrong and they reclassify it so that we are informed uh, of that. Jimmy, sorry yes? for disturbing, but we don't, do not see your slides. Uh, we see your slides, but it's still the, the fourth slide. So, um... Oh, that's strange. What do you see now? We still know, this is Dow. So still one of the first slides. That's strange. Okay. Can you tell me what you see now? Yeah, no, it's moving. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go over it all over again from the beginning. No, no, I think we can go go on. <laughs> okay, thank you. So this was the overview of the pros and the contrast I was sharing, and now I was on this topic, the challenges we have as a Dow company to implement um, trade agreements. I spoke already about the operational uh, challenges we had. Uh, and the last one I wanted to, to explain was the administration and the audits. Also, that can be a challenge and, and, and quite time consuming, especially when you have audits from uh, customs authorities regarding your uh, processes. 
All the challenges on digitalization is especially for us as the dual sourced goods. So we source goods from different vendors in and out the EU, which can add an uh, additional complexity. Uh, our system setup and implementation is sometimes quite cumbersome. The maintenance of your uh, of the system itself uh, needs to be considered and can be a challenge quite quite sometimes. The non-identical FTAs give an additional layer of, of difficulties to implement uh, trade agreements uh, in our system. And then integration of different systems and working and operating interoperable, interoperable with, with one another is uh, sometimes an, uh, a challenge as well. On the regulatory um, side, yeah, the knowledge and the collaborations with specialists uh, due to the uh, a lot of free trade agreements that are in place, uh, we need to have the knowledge and you need to have the people in place who can really understand the legal context and the legal legal uh, written language and, and how to, uh, to to understand it and implement it. Following up and enforcing our rights is also quite often a challenge. We, we see really often the reoccurring issues in, in countries where we uh, export to, where our uh, preferential statements are not um, accepted. And mainly because the fact that we uh, print our, um, let's say, invoice declaration, uh, as they say, or a preferential statement on the uh, delivery note and not on the invoice. That's, that's an internal decision we have to be many years ago. Uh, and that quite often gives some, some issues and then enforcing our rights is, is not always um, easy to do. The availability and accessibility of information, I can say here, uh, it was mainly an, um, an, an issue in the past, but with having now the access to market um, database, that was an, a great game, game changer for us. Uh, and now a lot of information can be found over there and it's, and it's quite um, um, user friendly uh, as well. Um, and another um, challenge is, of course, the non identical FTAs. Now, Implementing or not, and create a value case as though we go to an, an let's say, a five step process uh, before we really um, set up a trade agreement uh, and roll it out. First of all, we analyze the flow uh, which goods are we uh, exporting or importing, to whom, um, all, that, all that kind of information, HS codes, and so on, is all gathered. Uh, together to see how, yeah, what the potential impact can be. Then we do kind of a value impact uh, analysis for external EU. Uh, what what would this mean in terms of duty savings for exporting for for both importing parts? Um, uh, and the other thing is also looking into uh, how much of that flow is is also um, delivered of those products or delivered within within the EU itself. And are there any special requirements from our customers on that that regard? Then we do some some, some samples, eh, calculations, and therefore we use the Rosa tool as well, uh, and also our own test environment just to double check and to make sure that we do it in the right way. And based on all what we've ga gathered over there, we list our requirements so that we can um, yeah make our system ready uh, to operate. Uh, and then just before we actually um, take the decision, we also do a cost benefit uh, analysis. Uh, and if all those elements together, then we decide if we go uh, for an implementation or not. The system we use within DAO is our SAP ERP system together with GTS, the global trade services system. Uh, that's also an SAP tool. How is then the process of, of setting it up? Trade agreement in SAP. First of all, of course, we, we look into the legislation and have all those uh, requirements. We update the, the required tables in SAP and also in GTS. And we upload an, an, an rules of origin uh, file that we receive from our software provider who prepares that for us so that we can easily um, upload it in, in SAP GTS. 
Then uh, at the same time, we also start with uh, collecting the vendor declarations, requesting them. Later on, you have to maintain them and aggregate them, of course. Next step is then um, having the calculations done. So we do kind of a testing before we go go alive. And then at go alive, we also, of course, uh, have a kind of an hypercare um, period where we uh, closely follow up all the calculations which are done automatically uh, after uh, the goods are loaded on, on in a container, for instance. We have set up in, in our SAP GTS system the calculation based on a plant level, so not on country level, but really on a production or on a plant level. When the, cal when the goods are loaded, the, cal the calculation is done, then we automatically print um, the uh, preferential origin statement on the uh, commercial document. In our case, this is delivery note. And um, then later on, when everything is, is going on, you have, of course, to maintain uh, your um, yeah, your system, uh, following up on the rules. Also, Ward um, explained this, you regularly uh, do a checkup if, if nothing has changed. Uh, and also uh, following up and maintaining on your bill of material if nothing has been changed uh, in there. Like, for instance, if you have a new vendor or the price has been uh, become higher so that it is not having a, an impact on the X works price, which you which can be then also uh, have an, uh, an, uh, an influence on, on on having a preferential or a non preferential statement. Sure. And some hi highlights. Uh, at this moment, we have 24 um, trade agreements implemented. And uh, just to come back on um, what has been said before by uh, Walter, also we didn't uh, implement a, the EU-Japan um, trade agreement yet. Uh, we hope to do it uh, this year. Uh, and there are several reasons behind it, but it's mainly the complexity and also the system setup that's quite uh, cumbersome. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of escalations within our own organization for DAO DAO, also with DAO and, and governments and DAO and trade associations, especially when we have some in the set of questions or later on when, when we uh, encounter some trade barriers or some blockages uh, somewhere in the world due to our um, uh, specific way of, of working. We have for uh, the trade uh, agreements, we have four teams who are constantly involved, not all of them full time, so it's all, almost 40 people, but not, not full time, but still um, all of those uh, all of those colleagues of me are involved in, in trade agreements and they are in the division of international trade operations, as said already, the preference team, and, and um, we have also the customer information group, that's the group who is responsible to collect all the, the vendor declarations. We have the team of the Diamond System Solutions, which, uh, which is responsible for having uh, the system running and setting up of the system as well. And then last but not least, the Customs and Compliance team, who are in, in, in the, let's say, in, in the... the um, in the seat, in, in the, the first seat, let's say, when, when escalations happens or audits uh, to take place at the moment of export or import. And savings, uh, annual savings for DAO, it's, it's into the millions. I cannot disclose the exact figure, but it's really in, in millions that we save yearly by implementing uh, trade agreements. So this was my presentation for today. Thank you for listening. And I hand it over to uh, Barbara. Thank you very much for this interesting presentations. Uh, first, I want to ask, are there any questions? I haven't seen any in the in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you prefer. Meanwhile, I have already a question for Camille regarding the trade flows. So you mentioned in the access to markets tool that uh, the trade flows are um, uh, you can see the trade flows, but my question is if you have a trade flow between the EU and Vietnam, does it only take into account the trade flow uh, of products with uh, preferential origin or all trade between these uh, two countries? For example, if I import, let's say, a product from uh, uh, Malaysia and I, uh, I don't do anything with it, so it doesn't have preferential origin, but I send it uh, to Japan or to Vietnam, uh, 
is it also taken into account in the trade flow or not? No, it's the general trade flow from the EU to Vietnam. So both trade under the FTA as a trade um, without taking into account the FTA. OK, thank you. I do not see any other questions. So uh, I would like to thank all speakers. It was very interesting. And Wouter, you told, uh, you told us that there will be a new study. So I hope the chemical and life science sector will be mentioned again, but then as the best student in the class. So uh, I hope there won't be any more missed opportunities uh, of free trade agreement, but you all use it. And uh, if you have any question, do not hesitate to contact Essentia. As mentioned before, we will send to you uh, a survey. And uh, if you have any suggestions for other uh, webinars, please let us know. I wish you a, a nice day and hope to see you soon. Bye.